So without further ado, I would like to introduce today's speaker. It is really my pleasure to host Andrea Guess from UCLA. Uh, Andrea has uh, started her career at MIT and then moved on to Caltech. Uh, as a graduate student, came to the University of Arizona as a Hubble Fellow, and then started her faculty position at UCLA, where she really has led over 20 years a tremendous effort in using the Keck telescope and adaptive optics to measure the uh, properties of the black hole in the center of the Milky Way. Now, what I personally find really remarkable about Andrea's work and her group is the fact that not only did they use a wonderful accurate instrument, but they pushed it to its limits, both with extremely careful work, but also with using the you know, latest state of the art in uh, algorithms and um, methods, statistical methods of actually getting the most they can out of the data that they received. Um, during her 20 years of uh, work, we got from hoping that we're going to have a black hole in the center of the Milky Way to conclusively not only and demonstrating that there's a black hole in the center of the Milky Way, but also measuring the mass of that black hole to an exquisite accuracy. And in recognition, besides many other awards, to this uh, amazing career, uh, as everybody knows, Andrea was the 2020 Nobel laureate um, in physics, um, really um, well-deserved um, award for a remarkable career. So today, her talk is going to be um, from the possibility to the certainty of a supermassive black hole. And I really do not want to take any of more of Andrea's uh, time. Andrea, please um, join us and start your presentation. Hello. Well, I'm delighted to be here today to share the work that we've been doing at the center of the galaxy. Um, and um, what, what, as Dimitri has already said, what I was interested in doing was using the Keck telescopes, which are the largest optical and infrared telescopes in the world in a new and different way. And the question that we started off with was, is there a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy? Now, before, I get into this, I really want to give credit um, to my colleagues. This is a program that's been going on for, for more than two decades now. Um, so it was a program that I began when I first joined the faculty at UCLA. Um, and uh, I collaborated with my two colleagues, Mark Morris and Eric Becklin, that are on the left. And then on the right, um, you see my very first graduate student, uh, Beth Klein. And I'd like to show this picture to really remind um, the audience that this has been a long, long um, endeavor, and also um, to remind me to say that at this at the outset, we when I wrote the very first proposal, this is a uh, it was envisioned as a three year program, and it was actually turned down. It was turned down because. Um, people didn't believe that the new technologies would work. Um, and they also didn't believe that we would see um, the motions of stars. So it's just a reminder, um, especially to the students, that when you propose things that are new and different, it often is hard work to convince people that um, these ideas um, will, will, will indeed work, that you have to do the advocacy um, and education to, dem uh, to, to convince people that what you're proposing is actually viable. What's ironic today is that uh, 25 years later, um, not only are we a much larger group, rather than um, collaborate, collaborating with three people, we're, I'm collaborating with um, a team, a core team of roughly uh, 30 uh, people and a broader uh, network of about 100. Um, and we've become what's known as a key project for the development of technology um, of large ground-based telescopes. What's seen in the background is Keck Observatory, and then we also work quite closely with the 30-meter telescope, uh, International Observatory. Okay, so there are two big picture perspectives on why um, studying the orbits of stars at the center of the galaxy is an interesting thing to do. First, from a physics perspective, we want to know whether or not a supermassive black hole exists. Um, and then we've today moved into um, the domain of testing how gravity works near these supermassive black holes, near, near a supermassive black hole. 
from an astronomy or an astrophysics perspective, um, we'd like to understand how black holes um, shape the, their host galaxy. In other words, what role do black holes play in the formation and evolution of galaxies? Um, what's shown here is the classic um, mass of a black hole versus mass of the central part of the galaxy, the bulge. And today we understand that um, these things are intimately connected, although it's worth reflecting back that two decades ago, we used to ask um, which came first, the galaxy or the black hole, sort of like the chicken or the egg uh, quest question. And of course we had various ideas um, to, to explain uh, why one would come before the other. But today we really think that they formed synergistically because they're such vastly different scales. Um, that to have this sort of correlation, um, one, uh, one has to invoke uh, uh, ideas that um, have them forming together. Okay, so let's go back and ask, um, how do we observe something we can't see? And that's an essential question when you study black holes, because black holes are objects whose pull of gravity is so intense that you cannot see um, them um, directly. Uh, so if we want to explain what a black hole is, we want to recognize that um, there are objects where um, gravity is one. Gravity has overcome all other known forces and forced the object to become the infinitesimally small object known as a black hole. They ultimately represent the breakdown of our understanding of physics because they um, um, represent a, a region of space where we can't describe the physics. In other words, um, we don't know how to describe um, the world that's very small, the world of quantum mechanics together with a world of objects with very strong gravity, which is the world of um, general relativity, which is what Einstein is um, so famous for. So while these objects are infinitesimally small, there is a size that we can associate with a black hole. This is known as the Schwarzschild radius, or um, uh, it's been popularized by Star Trek, so known as the event horizon. So again, it's the point, the abstract point at which light cannot escape from um, the black hole. Conceptually, it's also important because every object has a short shield radius associated with it. And it is the scale that you have to compress a mass down to in order for gravity to win or overcome all other known forces and force that object to become a black hole. And in fact, it's a very simple scaling with respect to mass. It's directly linked. It's a linear relationship. So if we could take the earth and squeeze it down to the size of a sugar cube or a penny, um, the, uh, that object would become a black hole. If we scale up, as we said, it's just linearly related. Um, if we scale up to the size of the sun, the mass of the sun, and force that object to become the size of a university campus. Here I put UCLA because that's where I work. Um, it becomes a black hole. So conceptually, the proof of a black hole comes from showing that there's a lot of mass inside a very, very small region. So that's what we're after, showing mass inside a small volume. Now let's also look at where these um, black holes show up in the universe. There are two kinds of black holes that um, people talk about in astrophysics. Um, the, what I would call the ordinary uh, mass black holes or the ones that were um, conceived of first from a theoretical perspective. Um, these are objects that um, were predicted to result from the evolution of very massive stars. So stars with roughly uh, more than 30 times the mass of the sun and their lives as um, stellar mass black holes. What's shown here is a supernova. So the supernova is part of the end stages of these very massive stars. The star explodes, the outer layers um, are, are um, ejected, which is um, important for all sorts of um, reasons. But what we're interested in from the point of view of this lecture is that the inside, the inner layers um, collapse to form a stellar mass black hole that's roughly 10 times the mass of the sun. The kind of black holes that I'm interested in this talk are the supermassive black holes. Um, and this is what we're talking about at the center of the galaxy. 
these supermassive black holes, the, the, how we arrived at this conclusion is a very different um, approach um, in the sense that the stellar mass black holes were thought of first from a theoretical perspective and then demonstrated observationally. And today we have beautiful observations of the stellar mass black holes from the gravitational wave um, detections. But today, um, the supermassive black holes um, were not predicted theoretically, but rather it was observational evidence that made us start to um, think that there might be these really massive black holes, black holes um, that are a million to a billion times the mass of the sun. So orders of magnitude more massive than the things that people thought of theoretically in the first place. Now, why, why did people think of these supermassive black holes? They thought of them because if we look at the center um, at galaxies, and that's what's shown here is a, a huge variety of galaxies. Um, let's focus in on the top left here. These galaxies have roughly 100 billion stars. The scale is vastly different. In this picture, which is taken at optical wavelengths where your eye detects, there's, there's nothing in particular that suggests the existence of, of a supermassive black hole. What we're seeing is prim more, uh, primarily the light from the stars in these galaxies. Now it's actually pictures or images at radio wavelengths, much longer um, than what our eye detects. And um, what, what was observed in a small subset of galaxies, roughly 10% of all galaxies um, have an unusual activity associated with them that can be easily detected at radio wavelengths. The most dramatic of which is seen in this image, which is these huge jets of emission coming out from the center and these jets move at very high speeds. So there's a lot of energy that's emanating out from the center. Similarly, in the center, the light that you can see in the middle, the dot, is unlike anything else that's pr uh, produced by um, stars uh, that we saw in the, in the um, earlier image. And the scale of the galaxy is um, roughly a tenth of the scale of this, this, this jet here. So it was hypothesized that this emission, this unusual emission at the center and these jets was driven by um, a very powerful central engine. And that was what gave rise to the notion of these supermassive black holes where um, it's the mass that was falling into the black hole or the feeding habits of the black hole that are driving this unusual activity. Okay, so now um, that gave rise to the idea that maybe all galaxies harbor supermassive black holes at their centers. And this is again, that a little uh, close in view of that galaxy that we were looking in um, at, at the top left uh, corner of the previous plot from Hubble Space Telescope. So this is what our galaxy would look like if we could get outside of it and look back. Um, and our solar system is in, one of, uh, is in a spiral arm that's about halfway out from the center. Um, and almost every way we can describe the center of our galaxy, which is quite typical, um, is more extreme as we go to the center. The density of stars goes up, the speeds of stars goes up. And this is where we're looking for the existence of a supermassive black hole, right at the heart of um, our galaxy. Now, looking at our own galaxy for the existence of a supermassive black hole has the advantage of proximity. So our galaxy center is the closest example of a center of a galaxy that we'll ever have to, to look at. Um, but like in life, for every pro, there's usually a con. And in this case, um, the con is that we have to look through the plane of our galaxy. So galaxies are flattened disk-like um, geometries. And when we look towards the center, we have to look through all the stuff that um, uh, lives within the plane of the galaxy. So this is a picture that's um, taken from the side of um, the big island in Hawaii. Uh, and you can see the plane of the galaxy. That's all the light, the light band that's uh, running uh, up and down in this image. But you can presumably also see the, um, the, the lack of light that's running through the plane. And that lack of light comes from all the dust that also resides in the plane of the galaxy. If you live in a smoggy city like I do, Los Angeles, we have a very good idea of what dust in the atmosphere does to us. It makes it very difficult for optical light um, to penetrate all that, um, all that dust. 
So that means um, that we can't see easily the stars at the center of the galaxy at optical wavelengths. Um, but if we go to the infrared, the near infrared in particular, which is just longward of what your eye detects, um, that light is very good at penetrating um, through the um, uh, all this uh, all this dust. So the development of infrared technology was essential um, a piece of the puzzle for why we were able to do this experiment at this particular moment in time. Okay, so the, the, the approach is a very direct measurement, which is to measure the motions of stars at the center of the galaxy. So first you have to be able to, to see these stars. And the original idea was just to measure how fast things were moving, not to see the complete orbits, and then to argue statistically based on how fast the stars were moving, um, what the mass was at the center of the galaxy. Today, we've gone far beyond that uh, initial three-year concept, and we've been able to measure the complete orbit, which is a very, it, which is the, um, the most direct evidence for the existence of a black hole. Um, because these orbits are driven by the same physics that um, drive the, the orbits of planets around our sun. So if you can measure the orbit, you can infer the mass um, inside the orbit. And of course, the scale of the orbit tells you um, the scale, uh, the size to which you've confined the mass. Uh, so just recalling that your, your job is to show that there's a lot of mass inside a very small volume. Okay, so your, um, the, the goal then is to see or detect um, the stars that are as close to the center of the galaxy as possible. So we're inward bound and that, um, hopefully um, helps you understand why I was so interested in getting access and working with the largest optical and infrared telescopes in the world. So this is what's um, shown here. These are the two Keck telescopes. To give you a sense of scale, you can see these are um, large um, SUV vehicles down at the bottom here. And the way we describe telescopes um, is by um, the diameter of um, the primary mirror. And this is a 10 meter uh, meter. So that's uh, mirror. So that's roughly the width of a tennis court. Um, so, in, uh, and in fact, um, another uh, piece of technology that was critical was actually moving to segmented um, telescopes. Um, so rather than building a single mirror, um, the ability to build um, segments of a mirror and uh, align them well enough to a fraction of the wavelength such that you could um, make those segments act as a single mirror. So there are 36 hexagonal segments that comprise um, this primary mirror. This was really radical um, at the time that Keck was doing it. And yet um, today, the success of Keck um, uh, means that man, uh, many, many um, of, uh, large ground-based telescopes are uh, built with this geometry. And in fact, even um, the James Webb Space uh, Telescope um, has a similar uh, geometry. Okay, so in principle, large telescopes give you um, two advantages. One, a large telescope allows you to see very, very faint things because um, it allows you to detect a lot of light. It's basically a big light bucket. But the reason that I'm interested in these um, large ground-based telescopes is that the larger your diameter of the, of the primary mirror, the um, higher or the better your angular resolution, the better detail that you can see. And the technique that I like, uh, or the analogy that I like to make at this point is um, to the technique of the, the painting technique of pointillism, uh, of, of painting with dots. And the closer you stand to the painting, the better your ability to um, resolve or see the individual dots. So having a larger telescope in principle allows you to resolve the detail that you can see um, uh, uh, in astronomical imaging. Okay, that's, that's in principle. The larger the telescope, the, the finer the detail that you can see. Now the challenge, um, Oh, actually, I forgot I was going to go here. The, where these telescopes are is the big island of um, Hawaii. This is, um, Hawaii is a great place for um, building um, these ground-based telescopes. Um, and there are a couple of reasons for that. One is that you want to be at a very high um, elevation. 
Um, and this is a, a photograph I took um, on one of my first trips up there. You can see that the weather is below you. This is in a region called Apollo Valley. It's uh, where the first moon, uh, the astronauts for the early moon landing um, train, because this is what they thought the moon would look like before they had gone. Um, and if you travel up here, you see the flights that are going between the islands um, fly uh, at about this level. Um, so uh, uh, the height here is about 14,000 feet. So high elevations are useful, gets you through most of the, uh, much of the atmosphere. Um, and then the other piece uh, for large ground-based telescopes is that you want to be um, surrounded by large bodies of water because that makes the flow of air over your telescope very smooth. The other aspect that um, astronomers are always interested in in this business um, when you're working uh, in the uh, uh, at optical and infrared wavelengths is to um, be at a site where the uh, light pollution is very low. And this is an image that is always very striking um, to me because it's the world, it's a mosaic of the world at night. And so you can see um, where um, what parts of the, of the earth are developed. Um, and astronomy has an interesting tech, uh, tension because you both want low light levels, um, but you also want high access, um, high access to high technology um, uh, industries. Um, so those two things are in um, opposition. So Hawaii is one of the few places um, that um, allows you to satisfy uh, both criteria. And here's a, an image of um, the top of Mauna Kea, where you can see that there are about a dozen telescopes from nations all, um, all over uh, the world. Um, the ones that we're using here are the two Keck telescope, which look like the two tennis balls uh, in the foreground. Uh, next to it is uh, the Japanese telescope. Uh, in the background, um, you see um, uh, telescopes uh, that are put up by um, uh, France and other, uh, and other countries. Okay, so the problem, um, these telescopes are, uh, have been uh, very effective at seeing very faint things, but it's been harder to achieve the goal of high angular resolution, and that's because of the Earth's atmosphere. The Earth's atmosphere is great. It allows us to survive here on Earth, but it is a total headache for astronomical imaging uh, because in the last 30 microseconds, the light that's, come, uh, that's been traveling uh, to us from the center of the galaxy for the last 26,000 years hits the top of the atmosphere and gets completely distorted. This is um, some of the data that we took um, in our very first um, uh, observations. And it's just short pictures of the center of the galaxy. Um, the black hole today we understand is uh, roughly where my, uh, my cursor is. And if there were no atmosphere, each one of these five bright stars would be the size of the smallest structures that are dancing around and would be rock solid. So it's the atmosphere that's, um, that's, that's doing this to us. So there's been a tremendous amount of work uh, focused on uh, historically overcoming the atmosphere, and that's why we have Hubble Space Telescope and now the James Webb Space Telescope. But, but compared to Hub, um, the CAC, these are still um, small telescopes. So in the case of Hubble, this is a 2.4 meter. In the case of um, James Webb, this is uh, which is a six meter. Um, Keck on the ground is 10 meters. And the benefit um, of getting to the diffraction limit for the kinds of studies that I'm doing goes as the diameter to the fourth power. So it's a really big advantage if you can figure out how to correct um, from the ground. All right, so um, this is what I've spent much of my career working on is um, techniques for overcoming the distorting effects, the blurring effects of the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and in the course of this experiment, there's been a tremendous evolution of how we go about this. Um, and this just shows the bottom line of um, using a technique called adaptive optics, which is the more contemporary approach. Um, here are the five bright stars that we were seeing in the, in the earlier speckle image, uh, sorry, in the early images, those, those uh, bug splat patterns. Um, 
And you can see that if you take a long exposure, things get blurred out. And if you can overcome the blurring effects of the Earth's atmosphere, you can actually see the stars that are where we think the center of the galaxy or the black hole resides, which is in this um, inside this box. Um, in the early days, what we did was to just take short exposures and then in post-processing, um, to deconvolve or decouple what the atmosphere is doing versus what the underlying um, image is. And in fact, this technique worked um, remarkably well. Um, and this is what everybody used for the first um, 10 years of this experiment. And um, I can look at this image for a long time. Uh, this is, uh, again, in that central box. You can see the stars. So one, you could, it, it actually, you, you can get to the diffraction limit. You can see stars. And you do not need a computer to tell you that these stars are just hauling. You can probably find um, not only my favorite star, but the most powerful star for telling us what's at the center of the galaxy. It has the name S02. Um, the naming convention is S for um, Sagittarius, which is the radio um, source associated with um, the black hole. Um, zero, because it's um, in the closest annulus, and then dash two, because it was the second closest in this annulus um, uh, at the time of discovery. Okay, now um, as in the second decade, um, we've moved from this very simple approach, which was hardware simple but software complex to a hardware complex um, and also software complex um, uh, technique. Okay, so there's a, an amazing uh, or remarkable story associated with this uh, because at the same time that the astronomers were trying to figure out how to overcome the distorting effects of the Earth's atmosphere, um, so were the military. The military also cares about looking both up and down um, through the atmosphere. And the military, of course, has far more uh, resources uh, than the astro astronomical community. And in the mid 90s, this is a technology that was declassified. And then the astronomy community, for the astronomy community, it became um, a problem of applying um, these techniques to astronomical settings. So this animation nicely shows how this technology works. So we see the light coming, um, bouncing off the primary mirror and heading into the instrument bay, which in this case, in this animation shows it behind the primary mirror. We're go um, there are a couple of miracles that happen in this animation, including the dome going away and various walls going away, but we're gonna see the light make its way through the adaptive optic system. And the top in the top right is the most important feature of this system, which is the deformable mirror. The deformable mirror is a re, um, a, a re image uh, optic of the primary mirror, and it can move at much faster speeds than you can move those primary mirrors. Even though it's segmented, those segments are really heavy. And so we're going to look at the wave fronts. The wave fronts are now distorted by the atmosphere. So I like to say they look like Pringles potato chips. And then the job of this deformable mirror is to take the opposite or conjugate shape to um, the uh, what the atmosphere has done and flatten those to make them look as close to pancakes or flat pancakes as possible. Um, and if it's successful, that's what allows you to recover the high resolution imaging potential of these large ground-based telescopes. Um, so roughly halfway through this experiment, we really got to the point where these um, technologies were scientifically productive. Now to do, um, to do this um, anywhere in the sky requires creating a, a bright star. And we do this with lasers, lasers that stimulate the sodium atoms um, that reside thanks to um, meteors uh, in a very thin layer at about 90 kilometers. So this is just a fluke of nature that we take advantage of. We create an artificial star by stimulating those sodium atoms. We can look at those bright stars and then make this deformable um, mirror do its job. And doing this, um, and again, focusing on that central region, um, we get much better um, image quality than we had before. And for the first time, we can not only take images, but we can take spectra and um, image also at different wavelengths. So it really has dramatically improved the power 
of um, the kind of measurements uh, that we make. Okay, this is an animation of what we've been able to do in terms of tracking the motions of stars. I wanna emphasize that this box now is a fourth the real estate of that tiny box that we were already looking at. Um, and when these stars are tracked by images, they're trailed by a dashed line. So some stars appear simply because adaptive optics allows you to see fainter stars. And then once you can, um, uh, takes a spectrum with adaptive optics, they get trailed by uh, a solid line. Okay, with images alone, I wanna emphasize that you can already get um, the, the full orbit, um, uh, but you can't get the distance. But once you have spectroscopy and imaging, um, you can get both the mass and the distance. And in terms of this connection, the connection between this project and the Event Horizon Telescope is that this project provides a very good um, determination of the mass divided by the distance um, to the black hole. Okay, so you need both the images and the spectra, sorry, the images and spectra to do, um, to get mass and distance. Um, SO2, which is shown here in yellow, um, is the most powerful and it comes within roughly 500 short shield radius uh, right, of, the, of the black hole. And its orbit uh, tells you that there's 4 million times the mass of the sun inside its orbit. So before we, uh, when we set out at the beginning of this project, we knew that there was 4 million times the mass of the sun inside an enormous region. So really what this project has done has to confine the mass to a volume that's a hundred, sorry, that's a 10, million times smaller, so 10 to the seventh um, times smaller. So that is what has moved the case for a supermassive black hole from a possibility to a certainty by that tremendous um, uh, um, increase um, in the effective density that, that's been inferred and has confined this 4 million times the mass of the sun to a region that corresponds to roughly the size of our solar system. If you think about that, that's rather remarkable. And inside our solar system, we have four sun, sorry, one sun. And then in uh, here, we have 4 million times uh, the mass of the sun. Okay, so we now have the strongest evidence for the existence of a supermassive black hole. Um, and not only, and it's in our own very backyard. So moving forward, um, with this program, we uh, are now turning our uh, attention to other questions. And one is the question of how does this black hole shape the galaxy in which it resides? And this is actually um, uh, some of the most, um, to me, the, some of some, the fun aspects of, of doing science, and in particular, working on technologies that can change your um, view of um, the universe. So the, the, there are many predictions that you can make about um, what you should see near the supermassive black hole. One is that there should be a tremendous number of old stars around the central supermassive black hole. And in fact, that central concentration that um, is expected to reside of stars around the supermassive black hole is a um, way that people have used to look for the existence of supermassive black holes in other galaxies where you can't do this kind of um, uh, orbital measurements. In fact, the center of the galaxy is the only place that we can do that today. So you look for the concentration of light to infer the, the existence of a supermassive black hole. So here we, ex we expect to see a concentration of old stars. The second prediction that, um, uh, that uh, can be made and in fact was part of the argument against the existence of a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy was that you don't expect to see young stars. Young stars form from fragile um, clouds of gas and dust that collapse under their own self-gravity. Now black holes tend to pull these um, clouds apart. Um, in other words, they get distorted um, and so in fact, that's the opposite action that has to happen in order for clouds um, uh, to convert to young stars. So you expect there should be no young stars near um, the central supermassive black hole. Now, if we look at what we actually see uh, at the center, oh, this is supposed to be playing, it played when I practiced before. 
How sad. Okay. I don't need this animation to be playing, um, but because the key thing here is to um, notice the um, color coding. So um, this is, it's a, it, it, you can see this online um, in three dimensions. Um, it shows you um, the shapes of the orbits, uh, but it also codes them to what kinds of stars they are. So with spectroscopy, we can figure out um, whether or not they're old stars or young stars or things um, that we don't understand. So the most prominent um, kind of star that we see are the, are the um, young stars, which are color coded um, this aqua blue or aqua or green or blue, depending on how you perceive it. Um, so in fact, the, um, we are the population of stars dominated by the young stars, which we didn't expect to see. So this is um, Riz, uh, this has raised the question of how do young stars form in such an extreme environment? And one important clue has come from the geometry in this three dimensional animation. Uh, uh, you would see uh, this uh, that many of the orbits for the young stars form uh, fall in a common plane, very much like our solar system, which suggests that the way these things formed um, was from a pre-existing um, accretion disk, suggesting that perhaps our galaxy was much more like the active galactic nuclei than it is today, not only forming these young stars, but also feeding the central black hole. The second thing um, that um, I want to point out in this image is the old stars, which we predicted to be very um, plentiful. And yet those are the orange stars, and there are very few of these. There's actually a dearth of the old stars. So um, there is this question of where did all the old stars, or at least the old stars that we can see go? Um, and that remains um, a question and may be tied to um, uh, a third mystery, uh, which is uh, in, uh, associated with these magenta objects. These magenta objects are objects that appear to be um, uh, pulled apart as they make their closest approach. There's actually this, I think the animation works. Um, so this, these objects we didn't think to make predictions for, but in fact, they're the first objects that where we see um, the evolution of the geometry of the object. And while this animation suggests that they're, they're, um, it, it's uh, torn apart and destroyed, in fact, we see that um, they, um, they, they continue to, to survive. The, the interpretation that we have today for these objects, that they may be pairs of stars that have been forced to merge by the um, interaction with the central black hole. Uh, and this may provide um, an interesting connection to um, the gravitational wave um, community where they're seeing objects, stellar mass black holes that are much larger than they expected and um, seeing mergers that are happening much more frequently. And so what we may be lighting up here is a physical process of, um, that, that highlights the importance of the central black hole in driving binary stars to merge. Okay, so that's... Um, uh, a little bit of the story around the astrophysics um, of the central black hole that has um, come up, uh, been revealed um, thanks to our ability to see the center of the galaxy in a new and different way. In the final few moments, I want to return to um, uh, the question um, of how does um, gravity operate near a supermassive black hole. And now, um, with enough time or enough um, coverage of these stars orbits, in a particular SO2, which goes around every 16 years, um, and it's quite eccentric, moving from um, a part of space time where um, uh, there's more commingling of space and time to less commingling, we have a unique opportunity to look at um, or to carry out new tests of, of general relativity. And there are two tests that are um, within our reach. Um, and the first, um, which occurred, was associated with um, what happens at closest approach to the photons. So in other words, um, 
once you have the, sh the geometry of the orbit established from a complete um, passage, so you need to wait 16 years, and it turns out we were roughly around here, the next thing, um, as it went through closest approach, we could ask about the relativistic redshift. In other words, um, what happens to the photon as it climbs out of the gravitational potential of the central um, uh, supermassive black hole? The prediction is that there should be a loss of um, energy or shift in the wavelength as the photon um, has to make its way out of the central potential. And that's a shift that you see spectroscopically, but you need to determine the shape of the orbit. Now, the, um, so let me uh, just share with you um, how, how this um, worked. So this, the closest approach occurred in 2018. For us, this was a very um, exciting moment because we could, you could predict it. And anyone who studies orbits will tell you that it's these turning points or these, um, these points where your um, observations go through a maxima or minima that are essential. So in 2018, there were actually three of them, three out of the four possible that occurred over the space of, of a six month period, which was why that summer was so particularly important. And what you expect to see is this shift, this relativistic shift of a roughly 200 kilometers per second associated with a photon um, losing energy as it climbs out of the gravitational potential. And it was beautifully seen here, that difference, that extra um, shift from the gravitational um, redshift. Um, so it was uh, beautifully confirmed. Now, the second um, thing that you can look at is known as the precession of the periapse. In other words, the fact that the or shape of the orbit should, um, should may be consistent, but actually you should see it um, um, shift over time, kind of like a kid's Rosetta uh, uh, toy. Uh, so it um, doesn't come back to where you expect it, but rather it should overshoot um, because of the, um, the, the effects um, that occurred deep in the central potential. So you expect it to go in a particular direction, in a, what's called a prograde direction. And what's so interesting is, um, and, and this you, you, you expect to start to emerge after um, your closest approach measurements and will get stronger and stronger as you go to the furthest approach, um, uh, which for us will happen in 2026. So we're actually in the midst of where this signal was expected to emerge. And what's so interesting, and for me, this is one of the in, uh, most interesting moments in uh, research is when you don't see what you expect. And in our case, it's the orbit appears to be um, opening up in the opposite direction. Now, this is the point at which you have to ask yourself, are you seeing physics or actually do you have a problem with your methodology? And it's, it's super important to keep this in mind because you're trying to put together 25 years of data consistently. And it's very easy to get the accumulation of small errors um, to, to give these effects. You're looking for very, very small effects, both for the gravitational redshift that we I uh, just showed and this um, precession effect. Um, so there are a lot of ways to go wrong. Um, and I guess what I, how I would describe this in terms of what my group is doing is uh, it's like going around the the car and kicking all the tires to, to see, you know, where, um, you know, what's robust and what's not robust. Uh, but if you took this seriously, and you know, there's, uh, you could interpret this as the presence of dark matter at the center of the galaxy. And um, that would uh, suggest the existence of just shy of 20,000 times the mass of the sun inside the orbit of SO2. Now, what's so interesting about this number is this is the number um, that you would expect um, from the missing um, old stars. So in other words, um, this may be suggesting that that concentration of old stars may be there, but just in a, in, in a different form, um, in the form of um, stars that, or, um, or objects that are dark in the form of perhaps neutron stars and stellar mass black holes. So this is all exciting in very early days and it's um, part of what makes um, 
uh, studying the orbits of, of stars at the center of the galaxy, just uh, endless fun. Today, um, this study is, we're limited uh, um, to only seeing the brightest stars at the center of the galaxy. Um, and, and it may be that we're seeing exotica simply because we can't see the whole population. So what we are working on today is to improve our ability to see um, the, um, the whole population, not just the brightest stars. And there are two important things that are, we're driving forward um, to make progress with this study. One is improvements in the way that we um, do adapt, carry out adaptive optics. So today we use one a single laser to correct for the distorting effects of the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and the system that um, is being built today is to launch multiple lasers. And the, uh, um, it's a, uh, I'll show you a slide that hopefully gives you a sense of why this is so important. But effectively, this is doing a CAT scan of the atmosphere. In other words, letting us see um, the, the, the problems in the atmosphere that we can't correct with a single laser. So in this very cartoony picture, I'm showing you the mirror, the 10 meter mirror at the bottom in the pink and the light from stars that's very far away comes down in a cylinder. We're looking at light from a laser that's up at 90 kilometers. Um, and so the light from the laser probes um, a cone, um, but misses a significant part of the atmosphere. So today, the best we can do is to put a correct for 30% of um, the distorting effects of the Earth's atmosphere. And by launching multiple lasers, you pick up um, the missing pieces. Okay, this is called, um, uh, uh, you're basically doing tomography. And you can also appreciate that that problem becomes more and more intense as you go to larger and larger telescopes. And of course, today we have plans to build um, larger telescopes. There's three such telescopes in the world. Uh, I'm part of the consortium for uh, what's known as the 30 meter telescope. And as the name suggests, these telescopes are roughly 30 meters in diameter. Um, and will um, with these um, adaptive optic technologies that allow you to launch um, uh, multiple lasers will get us to the uh, much higher resolution. And this hopefully will give you a sense of the improvement going from the current adaptive optics to better adaptive, adaptive optics on the current telescopes to the future 30 meter class telescopes, which will allow us to see the most more typical um, stars like the sun. The analogy I like to make here in terms of our understanding is that by only seeing the tip of the iceberg, the brightest stars that are more um, less um, common, it would be like trying to understand our economy uh, by only looking at the largest transactions. Um, uh, if you miss all the small but more frequent um, uh, transactions, you have a very incomplete understanding um, of, of the entire system. And that's exactly uh, what's happening here. So there's a, I think there's a, an exciting future that um, uh, is in front of uh, these studies. Uh, and if nothing else, I hope in this lecture, I've um, helped you to appreciate how we've moved uh, the concept of a supermassive black hole from a possibility to a certainty and have uncovered um, more questions than answers. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very, very much, Andrea, for this wonderful talk. And I guess we can do the virtual clapping uh, in, in this webinar. Uh, we have a number of really uh, great questions, and I will um, organize them based first on science, then we'll go into the future and other questions that people had. So one of them is by uh, Avril Srivastava, uh, and he says uh, the adaptive optic algorithm takes reference waves from, from a point back to time back in time to flatten the distortions by the atmosphere. But uh, are you sure that the signal coming to the top of the atmosphere is flat? Is there any, anything between the atmosphere and the galaxy that uh, could actually distort it? Oh, you know, there is, a, uh, as if you think about the, the accidents, so to speak, that happen along the way, um, there are many things that affect um, the, the, the light. Um, starting at the center of the galaxy, all the dust that resides there. So that's more of an absorption um, effect than a 
um, aberration. So the dominant aberration effect is definitely um, the Earth's atmosphere. And certainly you can um, confirm, I mean, at lower resolution, the, um, that with pictures from Hubble Space Telescope, which is um, above this, um, uh, above the atmosphere. So it's the dominant problem is in the atmosphere. This, this, this very thin layer right next to the, the Earth's surface. Very good. Another question is, do the jets that come out from black holes help in the formation of those new stars? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, it, it doesn't appear so in the sense that the geometry um, that the young stars um, have is disk-like. Um, and that presumably tells you that it's, um, it's an accretion disk and it doesn't line up with anything associated with an outflow. Um, so it doesn't appear that these jets um, are associated with it. But the reason I, I think it's an interesting um, suggestion is that to trigger star formation, um, you, off, you need something to, um, get these clouds of gas and dust on different scales to compress. So a jet running into a cloud may trigger um, star formation. So on, on a larger scale, that may be an important uh, factor. Uh, very good. Another uh, interesting science question, I'm focusing first on the science questions, is for the SO2 star, how can you ascertain separately the mass of the black hole and the mass of the enclosed dark matter since they're both enclosed to the orbit? Ah, because what? Um, th thanks for that question. Um, so this is where uh, what helps you is that you're um, you're in an eccentric orbit. So the eccentricity um, is roughly uh, a little over 0 0.8. Um, so eccentricity goes from zero to one, where one is the most eccentric. Um, so at closest approach, so what you're really measuring is the mass that SO2 sees, the enclosed mass at closest approach versus furthest approach. Um, so you see a difference um, and you, you model that as being um, due to the extended mass. So you say what's seen at closest approach is just the black hole. And then what's seen at furthest approach is the black hole plus this extra mass. Very good. Um, also, um, somebody responded that when the Event Horizon Telescope takes the picture of the black hole and measure the mass of the black hole very close, then you will definitely be able to tell the difference. But some, somebody asked when we will have the picture of the Event Horizon Telescope. I think, respectively, I will take that <laughs> and say very soon. <laughs> right? Yes, very soon. But I, I also want to say that, that there's an interesting um, coupling, because remember, the, to interpret the event horizon um, picture, you need an independent assessment of the mass and distance to the black hole. Correct. Um, uh, let's go back a little bit to some of the other questions that were more uh, practical. One question is, uh, do you share the data for the stars i guess people might want to play with them themselves they're in all our publications yeah you so all the data are available another question um, related is what is the instrument i guess you talked a little bit about that uh, that will have the most influence on your future research and will jwst help to get better pictures of that so um, where james webb space telescope comes into play is it gives us the the broader context. So um, if you recall that the density of stars is going up as you go to the center. So resolu it, resolution becomes the ultimate name of the game. So in close, you win with the higher resolution afforded by Keck. But out at larger, oh, oh, but I, the thing I haven't said about um, this from the point of view of James Webb is that adaptive optics works well near where your laser is pointed uh, and then quickly falls off. Um, the performance falls off. So if you want um, to build up a, a very large scale picture, you're better off with James Webb out at distances where um, you're less affected by what's known as source confusion. So we, we have programs um, that are approved for this first cycle to give us a James Webb um, bigger context. So I think that'll be really helpful for sorting out the astrophysical um, questions. 
forgotten the first part of this question. James Webb and what was what is a future instrument that will help you the oh. most? But I think you already mentioned a couple well, of those. So but you there's the, yeah, say. there's uh, what's known as um, the adaptive optic system, which is known as um, uh, well, it's the, the multi, multiple laser adaptive optic system. And then you need an instrument behind that to take advantage of the better performance. So that's LIGER. And, um, and then the 30 meter telescope and its Very instrumentation. Good. Very good. Are there any gravitational lensing effects observed due to this black hole or will such observations be helpful further adding information about the black hole itself? So we thought about the gravitational um, lensing effects. And um, again, you have to model what you think is the underlying, what, what the underlying population is. Um, and it's predicted, uh, we predicted in a paper with um, Nevin uh, Weinberg in about 2005, that when you get to the scale of TMT, you should start to see the lensing effects. So we've looked, we don't see it today. Uh, but you should you should ultimately get to that scale. So we keep looking because you never you know you are always basing these simulations on your what you think is there. And if we've learned anything is that those assumptions are often unfounded. A similar question uh, is: um, Would frame dragging caused by the rotation of the black hole be apparent in the precession of the stellar orbits? Um, the prediction is that you should be able to get to that at the scale of the of the 30 meter telescope. So that's an effect, um, but you definitely at that point need to um, have multiple stars. So there are other stars other than SO2 that have enough of the orbit to play a role. So while I've emphasized SO2, um, as we get, uh, as we go forward, the orbits of these other stars and um, will become more and more important. So we're looking for that, We have, um, but it's not within our, um, our measurement capacity today. Uh, how exactly do those new stars form near a supermassive black hole? Aren't they sucked inside it? Ah, thank you. Uh, so one thing to keep in mind is that these stars are all um, still quite far away from the black holes. So these stars are not going to fall into the black hole or be sucked in on the on the on the on their lifetime within their lifetimes. To answer the first part of the question about um, uh, the formation, you need the density of gas to be high enough to overcome the um, the tidal forces of the black hole. If you look at the density of gas where these young stars are today, it's 10 to the 11th times too small. So it's not a little problem. This is a big problem or a big discrepancy. Um, and the way we, um, the best theory that we have today for how that happens is to invoke the existence of a very, uh, of a, of a, disk of gas and dust that's very dense that achieves that high that de densities that are high enough to overcome um, that uh, uh, that tidal force i think that was uh, both parts of the, that question yes um one uh, question somewhat related is uh, how does the uh, galactic the supermassive black hole mass increase and can it eventually squeeze the galaxy in due course of time so over the black hole increases um, its mass very slowly, and it does through um, the destruction of, of stars. Um, we think that um, a star effectively falls in or is dis, um, destroyed by the, the black hole once every 10,000 years. So this is a very slow process. Um, so there's you don't expect the black hole to have significant changes to um, such that it could affect um, you know, larger, significantly larger scales. Another interesting question uh, about other observatories. Can I, I think go back to that question. If Please. you're interested in this question of like what happens ultimately, there's a fabulous book called The Dark Ages um, by Fred Adams, which runs simulations of the universe out to its absurdly long timescales. Um, so um, these, these um, it, it considers some of those questions that you just asked. 
that is a fun book indeed. Uh, actually, a related question popped up. Is the size of the black hole variable? Is the, size the mass, I guess. Um, variable. Well, I guess in the sense that it's slowly gaining mass. Um, and of course, any law, mass, mass loss associated with Hawking radiation is even smaller than, I mean, it's very tiny compared to the mass gain associated with um, the accretion of matter. So the question about other observatories, can gravitational wave detectors be, be used besides telescopes to, be, to obtain additional information about black holes? I guess supermassive black holes. <laughs> Um, so there's a, I mean, I think we're in a really exciting moment for studies of supermassive black holes. I mean, um, beyond the, the kinds of studies that I've shared here, of course, we have the Event Horizon Telescope, which has already given us um, insight. And um, as Demetrius just mentioned, is stay tuned. Um, <laughs> Uh, but we're also looking at a future that will ho um, hopefully consist of the space-based gravitational wave detectors with LISA, um, where um, the gravitational waves from supermassive black holes uh, merging will be detectable. So um, that's just um, a few um, of the technologies that are being pushed forward that will give us new insight. And there were a number of questions about uh, can such a star itself be dark matter instead of a black hole, a bosonic dark matter, and uh, you know we used to call a bosonic star or this and that. What, where are we with respect to uh, what you know so far with alternatives from being an Einsteinian black hole? Yeah. So the alternate, the idea of alternative ideas to supermassive black holes. Um, there's been an interesting evolution and. Um, from the, the early days, two decades ago, when there were a lot of alternatives. I mean, you could have a, a cluster of um, dark, dark objects, you name it, black holes, little black holes, neutron stars, um, that would survive for long enough to, 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 um, to explain the mass that was seen at, at the outset, which is why people were really pretty tentative about the idea of a supermassive black black hole back then. Um, uh, in the course of this work, where we've moved from measuring velocities or speeds to accelerations and then all the way down to orbits, there's been a sequence of things that have been proposed. Um, one of the most interesting ones in my mind was the point when people were suggesting the idea of a fermion ball. So it was an, uh, an ana analog to a neutron star. So a neutron star is an object that's composed just of, of neutrons. Um, uh, but this is a, a, um, an object that is composed of more fundamental um, or uh, smaller scale objects of fermions. Um, and it has, it, it's larger than the, um, the short, it, you know, the scale of this is larger than the short shield radius. And what this project does is to um, say that the, um, that the mass of the fermion would have to be um, large enough that the most massive supermassive black holes, um, sorry, objects, such that the, ma the most massive candidates couldn't be explained by this fermion. I don't think I did said that well. Uh, but that's an, that's an interesting idea. So that's to say that you can still invoke it for our supermassive black hole because you're only down at about uh, 500 times the short shield radius, not at the short shield radius. Um, but it's an object that can't um, can no longer explain the range of masses associated with candidate supermassive black holes. So just to be open-minded about this. Mm -hmm. That's why we're doing it, right? <laughs> Try to, to ensure that we know what we're talking about. So I think this is uh, pretty much all the questions that we got, a wonderful set of questions. Thank you so much again, Andrea, for this uh, very you know, clear and illuminating talk with some new results. And uh, thanks everybody for participating. Before you leave, please uh, go to that short feedback survey that was just posted on the chat. We really appreciate your feedback and we hope to see you in the next webinar coming up in mid-May. Thank you.